Uh, hello, dear guests. We are welcoming you today in the part of the public program of exhibition The Artist as Prophet, created by Ksenia Malich and uh, Valeria Schiller. Today we have the part <coughs> um, public collection of co curator Ksenia Malich. She is art historian, curator, researcher, the head of uh, Pinchukar Center Research Platform. And today we're going to speak not about only about prophecy mm, that artists can make or not make, but also about very hot question nowadays about artistic responsibility. And we're welcoming you today to have the time together in this small circle. We're going to have the lecture, something around 50 minutes, and then we're going to have the QR session. So you can also be a part of that. And no more words. Welcoming Senya, thank you that you came just thank yesterday you. from Ukraine. Hello. You can hear me well? Thanks. Thanks, Katya. And thanks, Katya, for curating this uh, public program for our exhibition. And um, I have to say, um, I have to point the point from what I'm speaking about. And uh, I'm, I just came from Kiev and I'm based in Kiev and I'm happy and thankful for our army that I can live in, in Kiev. Uh, not every Ukrainian now have this uh, opportunity. And um, of course, um, to start with uh, uh, this um, lecture or just my thinking and speaking will be in two parts. Like we, I'm going to think about what is an uh, artist as prophet uh, and I hope that all of you can get that it's uh, a little bit ironic. And <laughs> another part is about responsibility and I found, found some point of entrance to, to think about artistic responsibility when we look at works of artists. So, um, just imagine, I'm art historian and researcher. I scroll all social media, subscribe to all Ukrainian artists, and every time when I see something, and then I can retrospectively can see that this work might be profit of something. It can be prophecy of something. And I want to speak about the nature of this prophecy. Uh, because we used to talk about artistic intuition. What is intuition at all? Uh, for me, intuition is about your life experience. When you have like some some number of events when you have some reflection and thinking about and then you can immediately react when something new is happened. This is intuition for me. So intuition is experience. And uh, if we talk about artistic intuition, it can be prophecy. So for example, I'm scrolling. I'm just scrolling my uh, Facebook or Instagram or sometimes checking sites of artists that I'm interested in. And for example, it's a work of Nikita Kadan, 2020. Uh, can you see that there in the corner? We can see soldier and Z letter there. And it's, uh, it, it's I'm not telling that Nikita made a forecast about future, but it's something that you start to think in. Can artists be a prophet? Because, and why? What is the nature of that? And my theory that artists, they are trying, they are responsible of our sensitivity in terms of history in our society when they see some mainstream thinking, mainstream ideas, like, I don't know, like majority moral or ethics, and they always try to find something that it's in, on periphery. They want to, to find something and to put it 
on, on the surface to highlight it. And that was also approach, a curatorial approach for this exhibition. We tried to highlight another problem that we have now for in Ukraine. Now we have a problem that guys, male artists, male person, they are limited in going out from Ukraine. So in this exhibition, we have artists that cannot came here. We have artists that are dead. We have artists who are now in the army. For example, Pavlo Kovac, his work is here. And he cannot be here because now he's in the army. So that was our approach. That's why I just wanted to point that that's why in this exhibition participants are only males. Another example, a work by Vlada Relko, hydroelectric power station 2014. It reminds something, yes? It, it, this work was created in 2014. We can see people who are, who are in, in Blood Lake or something, and we see definitely see hydroelectric power station. And it was made in 2014. Why? Why did Vladar Elko make such a painting? And the nature of this prophecy it's about intuition. It's about trying to feel harder what is happening. And as for me, I see artists as someone who, who are in charge of, of remembering everything, of trying not to put something on periphery. So that's why we have to be more like, we have to see and we have to remember what artists say. I always make jokes of them and said, please, can you please paint something really nice and positive like cats or flowers? <laughs> because usually your works, uh, after all shit happens like pan pandemic, for example, and, uh, and there were immediately a lot of pause. Oh, I paint or I made a sculpture or installation or a project about that two years ago. I said, okay, can you make something positive? <laughs> Just because uh, I don't know what worse can happen. Another work of Lesya Khamenka, 2010. It made in Gurzuf, Crimea in Ukraine. It was a residency. And she made metal weather vane and you can see it's made from metal, but it looks like a paper warship. And she really, literally, she took these toy guns and put it in this warship, in this ship. And then it turned to warship. And I asked Alessia yesterday, why did you do that in 2010? Why you did such a form of this weather vane? And she said, I was very much impressed with events in Georgia and I was feeling that the same scenario will come to us because the language of propaganda, the language with all this informational surface, it's pretty much the same. And in four years, we had annexation of Crimea and this work is and, and that's why we have to pay more attention to artistic works, I think. <clears throat> and after that, it's another part of my research on that question, is about responsibility of artists. Okay, they, make, they can make prophecy, now we know that. It's not all works, it's just some selection of me. And this um, work is not about prophecy, but about like diagnosis of situation. Artists uh, Daniel Rivkovsky and Andrei Raczynski, they are from Kharkiv. And the uh, focus of their interest is industrial, like post-industrial cities of Ukraine. And what we are, what we are talking about uh, when we are talking about post-industrial or industrial cities in Ukraine? It's uh, cities which were planned and built in Soviet 
era. And it was planned like celebration of industrial power of country. It's, for example, this project is dedicated to city of Kaminske. Before decommunization, it called Dniprodzerzhinsk. It's a uh, homeland of, uh, of um, Brezhnev. And uh, this city was, and uh, it has DMK, it's Dniprovsky metal combinat, and uh, it was built by, by Belgium people. They still have, in this uh, Kaminsky, they still have part of the city built by Belgiums for for workers who were building this DMK. Uh, and all these cities are, in, are very big. They had a big squares, a huge museum that was designed and built especially for this city. So everything is very, like, in architectural terms, is very luxury because this city had to be like very rich because they had like four very important uh, combinates: metal, chemistry, and coxa chemical. And so it was a really rich city in USSR. What we have now there, uh, even before full-scale invasion, what we had there, we had there very critical ecological situation. Young people were flee from this city, trying to find another place to live, and other jobs, and other things. So, um, this artist, Rivkovsky and Raczynski, they were making this research on this industrial and post-industrial cities. It's not only Kaminsky, but also Krivirich, uh, Dnipro, and other cities, uh, which were very important in Soviet times for industry situation. And they are trying to examine what the situation there, what these factories are working or not, what is the ecological situation there. So after a very huge research, and there are super maniacs on the, on the research, they are going very deep, they made a project, uh, and uh, in the framework of this project, they were painting letters on their facades of building, but not, not in a row. It was in a different uh, districts of city of Kaminsky. And they wrote, uh, they wrote letters. Uh, and if you, uh, and only in gallery you can read all of that, because in the city it's not visible, because they don't want, didn't want to communicate with, with citizens of this city. They wanted to communicate to all Ukraine, to all our society. And if we translate what is written there, it would be, we fucked up. And this is diagnosis of industrial situation. And uh, if we are talking about artistic responsibility here, I want to talk about we fucked up. Not you. And this is, for me, it's a um, point where artists are sharing and taking part of responsibility about that. And we, if we talk about this project from the point of art theory or art history, it would be a diagnosis about how artistic critique works. So they they're just facing that, okay, this um, generation, Rivkovsky and Rochinsky, they were born in 1994 and 1996. So they were growing in a uh, generation who were very much influenced by rap group. It's a revolutionary experimental Space, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> space. So, uh, and uh, it was a very much a politically critical group. And, and they were trying to examine, does this critique work? It, it's a very painful question for all artists who make critique in art. And that was not only their 
result of their research on industrial case of Ukraine, but also about a political and critical art that, okay, they, cri they criticize situation, but does it work? And that was a question because it was one, it was second their project. It was very early their project. So this is a result of it. And I want uh, you to pay attention to word we, because uh, we will see something more. And uh, let's jump to very early moment of Ukrainian history and to Odessa, to south of Ukraine. Our classics of uh, Odessa conceptualist artist, uh, Leonid Wojtsehov and also Valentin Hrush, they made public action. It called, they're gonna answer for it. In original, it was in Russian and it was, они ответят за это. Uh, what was the point of this action? Uh, it was a really super storm and a lot of trees were down and there was no electricity, no water in Odessa and everybody was very shocked because it was really a natural disaster. And after that, in the morning, Leonid Wojtsehov and Valentin Hrush, they made a huge transparent they are going to answer for it, and they were walking in the center of Odessa on the Rybasevska street. They were walking and walking, and even we don't have photos of this process. That's why I, uh, showing you, I'm showing you this one with Leonid Vaitsehov and all these broken trees. And after three blocks, they were walking. Uh, our Odessa policemen, they came to them and asked who they are going to answer for that. <laughs> and they said, of course, nature. <laughs> nature <laughs> will gonna answer for it. And, but policemen were not very, very much like understand them. And that's why they took them to the police department and they, then they didn't find the crime in their action, but it was something suspicious, really. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that was a case. And here I want to pay your attention to word they. It's, it's, uh, if we talk about times, it was 1984. So it was Soviet times and all this Soviet habit to blame some abstract power like city government or uh, country government, somebody, somebody who decided for us, somebody who made it. And it was very, which is absolutely natural for Odessa, this, this uh, ironic but very deep <laughs> uh, critique of situation. Can we, uh, can we call it critical ac action? Can we? Is it critical? Yeah, this action. Is it critical? <laughs> but whom did they critique? <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> they blame nature. <laughs> Of course, <laughs> that's why policemen decided that it's better to, to take them to police department. Another thing, 2018, Sasha Kurmas, uh, he made a photo on, on the chemistry. Yeah, chemistry is chemia. Uh, Cemetery, thank you. Uh, sometimes I will ask some English words. So uh, he made this uh, in the... Uh, Cemetery, thanks. Um, and he made this transparent there, it's uh, huge, and then he made photo, and it means your sacrifice were in vain. And uh, he put it in the uh, total installation at Pinchukar Center. He took uh, like half of our floor, and then he uh, turned everything look like ruins, and it was a very complicated project with a lot of elements, but for us now in this situation is interested um, this one, because your sacrifice, your sacrifice were in vain. It was uh, all this project, all this uh, work was dedicated to 
current at this time situation during the war, but it war was located in um, eastern part of Ukraine. And there were a lot of chronicles about these photographs, videos. Also, there were simultaneously in the same pro uh, pro uh, project, there were videos of uh, youngsters dancing techno on schema and, and other things. So it was like, um, it was a project about what time we are living in, historically meaning. And here, we can see we are talking about artists that he creates a distance because of this word, your, your sacrifices. And here in this situation, it's another thing. So let's, let's remember, first one was we fucked up, another was they are going to answer for it. Here is your sacrifice were in vain. And another project by Open Group, we were somewhere among you. And here we have we and you. And this project was realized in Poland, in Katowice. And they were there, um, this open group uh, with Yuri Belay, Stanislav Turina, Pavlo Kovac, and Anton Varga, they were in Katowice. And this project, what we can see on the photographs, what we can see in this documentation, it was realized after they left. For them, it was a very important part of this project. We were somewhere among you. And this project is about physical presence or not physical presence. It's about we and you. But here we also can see this divide between we and you. Who, who are we? Who are you? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question of physical presence. And they, uh, and they saw, the artists of this, uh, authors of this work, they saw that only on photographs, which were sent by or, uh, organizers, institutions, after they left. It was in, uh, in Polish, of course, because it was site-specific installation. And if we are talking about responsibility and all this, I was trying to search projects with letters, you know, when it's somebody pointing someone. And uh, I didn't find a photo because there is no photo of exhibition of rap group. It called you. And uh, when visitor came to the gallery, they saw this pointing. It was a painting, you. And it was like giving a subjectivity to person that you are responsible for everything. And they were um, a rap group. They made a lot of very important gestures. And they were formed in 2004 during a so-called Orange Revolution. And uh, they just, uh, they just um, formed like chaotically because they were participants of this Orange Revolution. And then they came, in those time, uh, Soros Foundation was active in Kyiv, so they came there to take leather to do some action. And they, the Soros Foundation proposed to them a residency, and they stayed for three years there. <laughs> so this is, this is how uh, political and critical art in Ukraine were established in 2004. So it's, uh, now you can see one of the photo documentation of their action, w which they made on the field uh, near Kyiv. And it, it called intervention untitled action. So and they were like making political action for no one in the field, in empty field. And I will translate uh, letters for you. It's tourism sports five times per week, culture and spirituality. So they were making political action very active with transparency, with flags, and we can see that they are acting emotionally, but for no one in the empty field. 
it was examining testing of the all these democratic procedures that we had in Ukraine and we had opportunity to to help them. And they made it on the field. You can see Lesia Khamenko in 2005, they made it on the field. Photos are very bad because it's 2005. <laughs> it's scanned from book, uh, it's really nobody has it bigger. And another thing, in 2006 they made uh, on Maidan, Nezalezhnosti, in our heart of our democracy, they made rap party, but party in political terms. They made their party with flags, black and white. They had some very absurdic uh, texts and ag uh, agitation and uh, also, but it was very bad photo, there were some of participants on the horse. <laughs> Just imagine. <laughs> And it was, and you can see also orange flags and or, orange uh, people, I don't know how they call this, all these political things, yes. So, so it's, and they were trying to ask, to ask people to try to build a critical thinking about what is going on, what, and that they were questioning, uh, like who gave money for that? They were questioning, and they were making some absurdic things. So they were talking about contemporary art problems. Of course, people on the street didn't understand that. They were even talking about Andy Warhol, about role of artists, about uh, about all the all the things, all the problems that contemporary artists in Ukraine in the beginning of 2000 had that time. Of course, some babushkas or other people didn't understand, but they were very interested in what's going on, because the form that they chosen for this action, it was absolutely natural form. They took form of political action in the public space, but they were communicating absolutely another things that were very hard to understand for for all this uh, so-called general audience. So they were trying to build a critical thinking uh, between people who are visiting all these political actions and people who are going to Maidan and to think about what's next, what's, what, what we want to do. So, and also rap group uh, were important for history of Ukrainian art because they were questioning uh, all these questions about artistic responsibility, about relations between artists and institution. What is institution? Just imagine in 2000, in the beginning of 2000, there were it was there were no Pinchukar Center, there were no Arsenal, there were no institutions except Soros Foundation. It was the one, and still we don't have a governmental museum of contemporary art of Ukraine. It's unique situation, which from one side is our, we are suffering a lot about that, but it influenced a lot of processes. For example, we have a huge part of older artists who feel themselves not loved enough in their country. They don't feel that they are they needed the country and that's and uh, the main issue and not only issue it's something that that rules all this system is that we don't have this museum that's why all institutions that we have private not private oligarchic not oligarchic like every institution they have some duties that has to be done by museum of contemporary art that's why archive of Ukrainian contemporary art is held in private institution. That's why everyone who wants to make exhibition called like history of Ukrainian art, they can make it. Because we don't have center. We don't have etalon. We don't have a heart of like political, governmental, like we don't have this. We don't have governmental 
policy of culture because we don't have museum of contemporary art. That's why everyone can do everything. It's not only bad, sometimes it's funny. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a, <laughs> the real situation that we have. Uh, we, have g we just have to face it because from year to year it becomes even more funnier. Because really we still don't have museum of contemporary art, come on. <laughs> Everyone had it, <laughs> but we don't, still don't. We, now we have even NGO called Ukrainian Museum of Contemporary Art. NGO. And uh, sometimes they shorten their title and it calls just Museum of Contemporary Art. But we know that it's NGO. It's not, it doesn't have space, it doesn't have governmental support, uh, with, it doesn't have museum museum community or museum network, nothing, it's just NGO, but that's the situation we have. Sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's as it is. Another work, another work is by Slava Mashnitsky. Um, it's an artist from uh, Kherson. It's a generation before rap, it's like generation of Parker Moon. It was uh, like his, uh, I don't know, star, star hours was in the middle of 90s. And he was artist and he graduated from Kiev Acad Academy of Fine Arts. And then he moved to Moscow and he worked in advertisement in the beginning of 2000. You just can imagine how many money and opportunities was in the beginning of 2000 in Moscow. And then he came back to his uh, native town, to Kherson, and he established Museum of Contemporary Art of Kherson in his apartment. And it's really something about us. Okay, we don't have governmental museum, we don't have a huge space, a good lightning, good uh, technical equipment, we don't have uh, enough art historians, we don't have enough curators, enough artists, but we have Museum of Contemporary Art of Kherson. And I think it's something really powerful. So he made it, and when full-scale invasion began, he we all were very worried about him because he's a very, like, he's a patriot of Kherson. And we tried to evacuate him from Kherson. We even gathered money for that. We made a lot of efforts to take him away. But he was like, I don't want to leave Kherson because now I'm fishing and Karas is fishing very good now, so I will not gonna leave her son. And it's very much about him. But now he, he is missed. And I think maybe he died. I think he, he died. But we don't know. And maybe we, ne we will never know. Because uh, in once he just disappeared and he is missed in action. And But he made this prophecy project in 2002 in Moscow. He made this paper about like wanted to find person and this is his photo. He made a lot of copies of this to just to blur his face, just to, lo to, to lose this or ori origin of this photograph. And he made a lot of copies and glue it in Moscow and center. And he made it in 2002. In 2022, his friends from Kherson, they made all this project from Moscow that he made. They made it in Lviv and Detanpula. It's artist-run space, it's very important also for history of Ukrainian art. Uh, Pasha Kovac, who now is serving in the Ukrainian army, he curated this project. And they made a map with all places connected to Slava Mashnitsky. And, and the, also they included place where all of us are thinking that he were or killed or just lost, we don't know. And we will never know. And this was it's a it's very sad prophecy about his life. And 
when we were trying to get him out from her zone, we were trying to communicate. I have texting with him. It's very poetic because he just didn't want to to be pathetic in this situation. He said, "Just I will not leave her son. I will not leave her son." And it was. And now, when I'm thinking about that, it's very natural. He didn't leave her son. I think he was killed there, but he lived all his last years there. It's something like part of his artistic practice. It became part of it, and that's why. To, to show a memory about him, they made this exhibition with the places connected to him and the place where we think he died, but we maybe we will never know. So there is some prophecy as, like that. And also, I, we have only two slides left. <laughs> uh, I want to also to add two exhibitions to this um, presentation, to this research. And one of it, it uh, was called Disputed Territory. And it was held in Sevastopol uh, in 2012 in Crimea. And of course, they didn't mean Crimea as disputed territory. The, uh, in this project, they meant the disputed territories for Ukraine for our community, for our society. It was territory of gender, or territory of sexuality, territory of um, conflict between private and, uh, and community. Uh, all these disputed topics were like a t one territory. And they wanted uh, Hudrada, it's a curatorial group, they they made a project in Crimea and Sevastopol. We just can imagine how hard it was to realize that. It was f um, financed by um, Renata Khmetov Foundation, and I, want, uh, I really need to mention that because another project will be financed with Soros Foundation. Uh, so it, it's, um, it was, they made it in museum, in very, very Soviet museum in Sevastopol. And in Crimea, where there were no contemporary art at all. And after that, and I just want to make some connection with situations that we have now. After that, in 2017, in Moscow, in Garage Contemporary Art Center, they established Triennale of Contemporary Art of Russia. And they decided, um, curatorial group of uh, Garage, they decided to include Crimea. And uh, there were questions for them. Why did you include stolen territory, annexed territory? And answer was, it's not, and uh, this answer was by Ekaterina Inaziemtseva, who is now curating Schinkel Pavilion in here in Berlin, which was opened yesterday, new exhibition. And she uh, said that it's not institutional position, it's uh, our like human position. Because all those artists in Crimea, uh, Ukraine didn't care for them, nobody cares of them, and we are trying to include them and to face them. At the end of the day, no one from uh, Crimean artists were included in this triennial, but w now we know it's because it's public published uh, this position of Nazemtseva about Crimea. Um, so it, it was just a small connection with the, uh, with the topic that we have now. And, uh, and, and also, uh, the important thing about this exhibition was public program. They made a huge public program there. They made discussions there about public space, about possibilities. Um, and perspectives of contemporary art in Sevastopol. <coughs> Spoiler, there were no possibilities for contemporary art in Sevastopol, and they were trying to push it. Uh, it and this, this uh, I think it's very symptomatic, because artists, they pointed, they uh, highlighted something. They made a focus on that 
There is Sevastopol, there is no contemporary art there, there is no contemporary thinking there, there is no Ukraine there, and they were trying to make something, and they made. And it was a lot of questions. It was, And I asked uh, Nikita Kadan, one of the participants of this Hudrada collective who curated this exhibition, how now he sees this situation. Uh, of course, he said that it was very Soviet museum and very hard. It was very hard to uh, to show them that contemporary art is not so bad <laughs> and uh, it's not so scary. Uh, and it was hard, but it was beginning. It was beginning of discussion. It's, it was the beginning of trying to find something, find a, uh, and of course. Uh, Speaking about strategies, they began with all the most painful moments. They came there with the questions of gender. Just imagine Soviet Museum in Sevastopol, talking about, with discussions about gender. But they were really, now when I was reading the materials of this public program, I was really amazed by how gentle they were because they underst understood that it was not easy, that their goal was not to show that we are very cool here with our, all our contemporary ideas and you are super Soviet and old. No, they were trying really to, to find, the, find opportunities to find all this popular world dialogue there. So, uh, and, and, um, so when some Russian curator are talking about um, that, um, Crimean artists were not needed for Ukraine. It's really something. And another exhibition. It's our last slide, Katya. Not 65 this time. Uh, and this exhibition is super important. And it's something, it's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. It's not just exhibition. It was exhibition made in 1994 in Sevastopol. Um, it was made, curated by Marta Kuzma. She was the first director of Soros Foundation. Um, Soros Foundation, they made offices in Eastern Europe. It was their goal to make, like, to influence through contemporary art with all these democratic ideas there. But when they came to Ukraine, they realized that only office will not help so they made a really expositional place, exhibitional place in Kyiv and later in Odessa. It was established in 1993. And next year, Marta Kuzma curated exhibition in Sevastopol on the worship, in the worship Slavutich. It was exhibition on the worship. It was Ukrainian worship. After 2014, it became Russian worship, and now still we've got sometimes missiles from this worship, Slavutic, to us. But it's another thing. Uh, it's the same thing, of course. So it was exhibition. Just imagine how exotic it was to make exhibition on the worship in Sevastopol in 1994. For example, Valeria Schiller was born in Sevastopol in 1994. Uh, the work of Arsen Savadov and Georgi Senchenko there uh, that we have an exposition, Voices of Love, were made for this exhibition in Sevastopol in 1994. For this exhibition, just imagine, she brought Ukrainian artists, now it's uh, like a superstars, Savadov Senchenko, Sergei Bratkov, Boris Mikhailov, and they made they made their uh, exhibition, all of most of installations, more, most of projects were site specific. They lived on this worship for a week with the whole team of worship. And you can see some results in the video work Voices of Love when you, um, yes. And it was made um, before Budapest Memorandum. And if you don't know, uh, in the result of this memorandum, uh, Russian Navy stayed in Sevastopol and all uh, Ukrainians, what they... Yeah. Debt, yes, and all Ukrainian debt was zeroed for that. So it's something really symptomatic. And, and if we now 
look at this exhibition. Unfortunately, we don't have expositional photos, but you, you can imagine now. You, you can imagine worship, a uh, budget of $7,000. Seven? Seven. But now, if we count now, $15,000 budget. 1994, $15,000 budget for exhibition in Sevastopol. It was first and last time there. And this, and Marta Kuzma, and just imagine for that moment, even word curator were associated only with KGB. Curator, it was not creative person. It was just KGB person. It's about controlling, not about co-creativity and all this making common sense. No, no, no. Not about discourse. Not about narrative. Only about controlling from the government, from the KGB. So Marta Kuzma, which later she became first uh, woman Dean in Yale Art School. So we are very proud of, uh, uh, of her. She was first director of Soros Foundation in Ukraine. After her, it was Yezha Onoch. So she made this curatorial gesture because it's not just exhibition in white cube. It's site-specific installation in a worship in 1994 in Sevastopol. It's really something super exotic even now. And when we, uh, we are reading now, uh, happily we have this uh, catalog with Marta's text uh, uh, for this exhibition, Alchemical Surrender. Why it's called Surrender? I just don't even want to think. Uh, but it's really, it was, what was the symbol of this worship in those times? It was symbol of power, of patriarchy of uh, power of country, of power of politicians. And she brought there the most crazy artists <laughs> that she, she had, and they made site-specific project there, site-specific object there. Even Bratkov with Mikhailov made uh, something about that it's very bad when women are in, on the ship. They were made ironic things. So. And the most of works and all this exhibition was ironic because it was really very, because Ukraine only began at this time and they were thinking about independent country of Ukraine. What we have, what we have, what army we have, what we have in terms of sources, what we have in terms of pers perspectives. And after that, Budapest Memorandum were held. And we lost Crimea that, in that time. Or we began to lose Crimea that time. Because all the Russian Navy was there and is still there. So I just wanted to, to show you this exhibition because I think it's everything in this project is super profit. It's 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 profit project, <laughs> like absolutely, totally, and uh, and uh, nothing as much as this project powerful never happened to Ukraine, because it was totally crazy. In 1994, all this uh, a team of uh, this worship were dancing in ballet dresses, how it can happen, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but it's about, it's about statement as a curator. So they were trying to find out what they have. What is Ukraine? It was something like a beginning of this question. And they used, and for them it was very principle, politically principle, not using expositional places. You know why? Because we did not have expositional places. We didn't have galleries. We didn't have uh, spaces to make contemporary art in that times. So that's why she said, okay, worship. I think she rocks, <laughs> really. <laughs> it, it, it's really uh, something that I admire. So that was my short, uh, I tried, uh, short 
uh, research on that topic. And of course, uh, now if you are uh, in Facebook, still uh, you can see. <laughs> You can see that now we have uh, a lot of questions and discussions about artistic responsibility because uh, some artists now are boycotting uh, Russian curators. Of course, we are not talking about Russian institutions. There were no Russian institutions anymore, but there are some, uh, I don't know, Russian money maybe somewhere and uh, but there are some russian curators and now we have a lot of questions about um, their position and who are victims and all these competitions and who are uh, bigger victims or smaller one so this idea of this lecture were more poetic about okay if you are artists are prophets and who is responsible for your profits and uh, but now um, artistic responsibility is something that are more depth in our l real lives and uh, talking about life and death and uh, now in Facebook uh, I can see that there is uh, something like starting as a developing of policy how to work in such such situation how to because of course we are all progressive and we are all know that freedom of of creativity freedom of art is a uh, very important <laughs> it's something that we cannot lose in any situation and now we have a perfect opportunity to discover the age of this freedom. Now we can see this edge, this border of this freedom. So I will not uh, put my opinion here on that. Uh, it's uh, always a question about everything is political. Of course, every art is political, so every time Everything which is public is political. Uh, and all of these are becoming political gestures. Everything that is public, even our clothes, are political. So uh, let's not forget about that. Uh, questions? Katya. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> Katya will provide you with an um, instrument for make your voice louder. <laughs> Called micro microphone. <laughs> have questions? Thanks. You said. Everything is political. Женя, 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 ближе. Просто тримай дуже близько, будь ласка. I want to ask uh, why we have not photos from this ship and this exhibition. I uh, know a lot about such situation that something uh, uh, somebody trying to popularize like uh, something political, but we have no material. It is very personal and um, closed to some people, like a special object that um, other people cannot uh, watch. Um, thank you for your question, Jenya. Uh, we don't have photographs of exposition of this exhibition because of another personal story. Because when uh, Jerzy Onoch came to, uh, and uh, he changed Marta uh, on the position of director of uh, Soros Foundation, there were some situations, uh, nobody knows what really happened, but there is no archive of Soros Foundation. There is no archive. There were some rumors that it was burned, stolen, or something, or it still exists, but as I know, only part of this exists, but no photos of exposition of this 
exhibition. It, that I'm telling you as a researcher of research platform because we really worked on it for years just to find. So that's, we have only works. We can see the works from this exhibition and, and we don't see, uh, we cannot see documentation of this exhibition because all archive of Soros Foundation are lost. And that also marks a problem about that we don't have a museum of contemporary art in Ukraine. Because, because if we had one, this museum should take all the archives from all institutions from 90s. And now when we are working on archive of Ukrainian art, the, we, uh, all this archive is based on private archives. Uh, Alexander Solovyov and everyone who were participating that we just go into them and very kindly asking them to give some documents from the photographs, invitations, texts, everything that they have. We don't ask to take it forever. We just ask to take it temporarily to digitize them and that's all. And that's how it works and it's really hard and takes time to to to, to make all this whole picture of that. That's why we don't have it. It was a huge scandal when uh, Jerzy Onoch came to position of director. He was blaming Marta publicly and very bad things. And it was not really nice. And that's why we don't have archive. And it's a huge loss. Thanks. And so, what to do that old uh, painters uh, who now are not like contemporary artists as what they paint? Um, and uh, what do you think they can do in these times? Because like I never saw a scholarship or grants for uh, somebody under 50 <laughs> uh, from Park Comuna maybe and others. So what do you think? Yeah, thanks uh, about this question. And um, it's another sad, uh, sad side. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can uh, refer to experience of Poland, for example. Uh, what uh, artists after 50 are doing in Poland? Uh, most of them are professors in universities because they had developed a system of art education. Um, and uh, for example, uh, and also they all the, their best their works are in collections of go in governmental museums because they have developed system of museums of contemporary art and uh, municipal galleries of contemporary art. We don't have this system. That's why they are lost. I, uh, and they are, uh, how they uh, live now, it's only uh, based on some private uh, supporters and you know how it works. But, and what to do? I think the system of Poland is good, but for us, it's not something that we can do in one day. It's about developing of educational system. It's about developing of governmental and municipal system of, of supporting of contemporary art. And it's always not time to support that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm talking about another thing, for example, like uh, something like queer art or something like this. Uh, yeah, there are archives and uh, archives and their institution, uh, for example, even in uh, Europe, uh, that uh, collect and try to research uh, the history. For example, uh, let's take queer art. Okay. Um, uh, 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 try to research the history of queer art worldwide. Mm -hmm. So like, and when I talk to them, uh, uh, to three or four uh, such archives, never, no one uh, from Ukraine, or um, we're not talking about aggressive, but also from Russia, mm -hmm. yeah, never come to them and try to make with them uh, like a project to research this history. Uh, 
Like, and when you're always here talking, and you know that I'm a um, permanent visitor of your lecture, yeah, you always are talking about Ukrainian institution and stop on them. But, uh, as I see, like creators from uh, Pinchuk Art Center, from others, uh, you, um, remarkable Ukrainian, okay, private institutions, yeah, uh, and uh, you uh, and the, uh, these creators come worldwide, but they still don't initiate such pro uh, projects that can collect, like. Uh, your father art is, mm -hmm. I see, is our history, yeah? Mm -hmm. Like, um, okay, Chichkan, okay? Like, um, um, Weisberg, mm -hmm. like, und and, uh, und <laughs> and others, yeah? So, like, and uh, uh, I think that this is the goal of our generation to make uh, worldwide projects and why you as an institution and also as a curator don't don't initiate why you stopped on ukraine like this uh, thank you Alona, for this question um, i think that a uh, system is working when everybody knows what they are doing and why you cannot do everything and that's why you have to be narrow on something now we are uh, our institution, Pinchuk Art Center, we are focused on such a category as called emerging artist. So it's not like super fresh, like not super green, but emerging and not established. And I think it's, it's uh, something that needs a bigger support now because we have to choose. We cannot cover everything. So we strategically chosen this category as emerging artist. So we make international projects where we support and integrate our... Mm, <coughs> yes, always the same artist. Like <laughs> Okay, but uh, for example, Nikita Kadan, uh, he's not no longer emerging artist. He's... Uh, He's established because his work are in collections of international museums. That's why uh, it's you, you, it's he is no longer emerging. Yes, but we are not not working only with Hamenka and Kadan. Yeah, uh, but in your question there is an answer because we are private institution. We are not. Uh, that's why we need governmental museum because governmental museum they are responsible for everyone, but we are responsible only for what we are thinking it's important now. This is a strategy. You cannot make responsible private institution for whole situation in one country. You cannot because it's private one. If we were governmental institution, we were in charge of everything, but we are not only one. That is my answer. Okay, next question. Thank you for such a lecture. Thank you for organizing this public program. That's very interesting. And uh, you mentioned this discussion very... hard one in the Facebook about the participating in not like with the in the collaboration not with Russian institution but with Russian artists and like I think more or less like all understand and all have heard this discussion like in previous year this year but um, I would like to know the consequences of that like when we are speaking about the discussion we are all the time I think we are a little bit missing this part of the future and could you like point out this um, like consequences of this cooperation it's a very interesting question and it's also a question for me <laughs> because uh, now we are in the center in the heart of this discussion and uh, nobody like nobody we can try to be a prophet of this but um, I, as I can see the situation, that uh, of course, 
everyone are very dramatic and we all have a right to be dramatic. It's maybe one uh, little w little moment in history when we have right to be dramatic all the time. And um, I think that in the very best case scenario, everyone will stay with their opinion. In the very worst case scenario, some of artists can feel themselves separated from uh, Ukrainian artistic community and, for example, will choose not to feel themselves part of this community. And where it goes, we never know. So, but this process is painful because this process will end with some policy about how how we have to react on that or what is the moral policy of that because moral policy is the question of each individual but but if we are talking about community we all now are talking about that all Ukrainians in Europe are ambassadors but do all of us agree with that do all of us are ready to be this ambassador? This is a question. And as we can see now, it's not all of us. And that is a question how not to become a totalitarian in that case. And that also is a question. And of course, everyone outside of Ukraine are very ready to perceive Ukrainians as Nazis in every moment. And that also is a question, how we have to react, how we have to act with our emotions and how dramatic we can be in that situation. Because all of us who have experience of talking of something that calls cultural diplomacy, they know that we are not have a right to be very much emotional. Because if we are emotional, nobody listens to us. They just answer, oh, you are so emotional. You are so emotional. And that's, that's, and that's uh, the case. I really admire persons and uh, Vicha uh, also, because you are making it every day. Really, I couldn't. Because to make all this cultural diplomacy in a very calm and diplomatic way, to explain every day some things that are super natural for us, it's really hard work and I admire that. But now, I don't know how it, uh, all these conflicts will end. Of course, it will, now, as I can see, I, I, it divided Ukrainian artistic community for two camps. One camp is, we will know be not be close to Russian nobody never never and another one that we cannot be such totalitarian in that approach and I think that everything has a place here but in terms of communication it's also very important because everything is political and we shouldn't be naive on that it's really something but we will see how it will end and now it's i think that every institution now in ukraine now is in the process of decision to work with this artist or not so now it was a uh, like it was obvious thing that it's a boycott of russian culture everyone understands why Yes, everyone understands why why it was idea of boycotting of russian russian culture because russian culture it's Russian tanks. Everyone understands that. But now it's a question to boycott Ukrainian artists who collaborates with, with Russian curators. It's another question. It's absolutely not obvious <laughs> answer for that. And that's, that is, and every time, and even like very frank example, Sergei Bratkov. Sergei Bratkov, artist from Kharkiv, and he has been living in Moscow since last summer. Very long time, like 20 years. 
there are a lot of moral excuses about that. He was working with Ukrainian artists who were studying in Rochenko school in Moscow, blah, 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 blah. He has uh, Ukrainian citizenship. And then, but, but he fled Moscow only last summer. And it was very big question for, very sensitive question. What to do with him? And that was a question. Do we want him or not as Ukrainian artist? Do we want to cancel him forever? Or we, do we need such a powerful figure in the history of Ukrainian art? Another situation with Yuri Lederman, artist from Odessa, very important extremely important for Odessa conceptualism, extremely important for Moscow conceptualism. But he is Russian citizenship, has a Russian citizenship. He is more patriotic than me, believe me. But he cannot give away his Russian, Russian citizenship. And now we are making campaign to support him to have Ukrainian citizenship. Absurdic? Yes. And it's always a question to, to have this artist in history of Ukrainian art or, or to lose. And we all share with this responsibility about that. Because frankly speaking, as art historian, we don't have enough. We don't have enough. Every artist is very important, really. Because a lot of art was stolen. A lot of, and I'm talking not only about pieces of art. I'm talking about figures. I'm talking about personalities, and they were stolen. Stolen by Russia. Russian Empire, Russian Federation. In USSR, Moscow was the center. That's why we have such a poor collections in Kiev museums. And that's why everyone is very valuable. And that's why we need to think. Because, of course, our first instinct just to cut and to say goodbye forever. But who will stay in history? That is uh, our moral dilemma. <laughs> Can I ask regarding this? Uh, no, of course. Yes, so it's not even the question uh, of the archive, yes? Who is, yes, let's collect all besties. No, no, it's not about that. Yes, I also absolutely against this. Uh, let's collect only those who are 100% patriotic. No, it's like about <coughs> artistic gesture and uh, heritage. So we're not talking about uh, uh, in this historical terms. Yes, of course. He, Boris Mikhailov and Bratkov and all of, uh, uh, let it say, artists, contemporary artists, also very questionable figures right now in not only in contemporary art, like writers, like filmmakers, they are also the heritage. It's about archive, yes? Mm -hmm. It's about history and about like future and heritage. Uh, but regarding situation of uh, word that no one is using in our artistic right now, this uh, shit storm, uh, the word collaboration, yes, it's um, it's about very sensitive topic, especially we're sitting right now in Berlin, in Germany, and this is a sensitive question because it's not only a question about, um, let us say, <laughs> relationship between, I don't know, this Stockholm syndrome of uh, Russian and Ukrainian artists, yes, we all understand that artists, they are, uh, because of their vulnerability, they make art uh, more deeper or they dig in poetic way, yes, it's not about question of this vulnerability or tra tra traumatic experience. We're talking about constant pushing the topic of uh, mm, Russian-Ukrainian brotherhood, sisterhood, we're talking about uh, pushing the topic of dialogue through these vulnerable, vulnerable groups. And it's not horizontal relationship. So we can, no, as part of Vicha, yes, as part of also, I don't know, group who are researcher, yes, uh, people who are working with 
memory culture a lot. Uh, we can 100% estimate that this is very uh, vertical relationship of German politic towards Russia together in hand by hand. And let's instrumentalize Ukrainian artists because what we were screaming in the beginning of full-scale invasion here, we were screaming, do not talk about us without us. Without us. And now we have this very sensitive moment, then using vulnerability, traumatic experience, this constant talk about uh, individual, let's talk about uh, this human-human relationship, this instrumentalization of some very good, very prominent Ukrainian artists, I would say. It's, this is why it's pain. Yes, it's not random. It's not, yes, it's like, it's painful topic. So using, by the hands of, uh, of course, it's, uh, let's not pretend uh, in uh, German language, let us say, area in Europe, I'm talking right now directly about Germany and Austria, there is a political um, narrative, especially in culture, because Russian works only through culture, yes, this uh, war through culture is also thousands of years and especially the last decades. So we're talking about instrumentalization by these victims. And this is the responsibility, as you said, uh, of institutions or how we see here NGOs. Yes, for example, I don't have uh, this answer because it's a question of uh, huge discussion. Yes, how we can how we can work with artists who are working with uh, this uh, how we say body of victim, the imperialization, the totalitarian topics as they are jumping different reasons. It's not only making a career. I know they are jumping to conclude and to be the part of still ongoing imperialization topics. So it's more than. There is a um, third party of all this situation, uh, like, let it call, like, a global leftist. <laughs> and, um, of course, uh, a lot of progressive Ukrainian artists are included in this leftist um, network with all these leftist narratives, leftist foundations, and stiftungs, and all of this. And, of course, a lot of progressive Ukrainian young and not very young artists are raised by these leftist foundations. Don't underestimate this factor. Because, because um, I should start with that in Ukraine artists and do not have a lot of res a lot of opportunities to to make something and to live, and that's why, of course, resi residences of uh, all these residences of leftist stiftungs are very popular, and it's and this situation like this when. Russian curator who is making exhibition in German institution uh, with idea of show or sh of showing museum pieces uh, that were called by Nazis of gen uh, degenerative art, and they uh, Russian curators are making exhibitions with this with this material, including Ukrainians. It looks so peacemaking, something that let's, let's get out from this moment and to look at this from a historical perspective. And this is like a test for Ukrainian left, leftist artists. Are you Nazi or not? And this is like, it, this, it works like that. Because if you are, if you are not going to participate exhibition which is against totalitarian who are you are you totalitarian it's just simple as that it works like that and 
now artists, Ukrainian artists who decided to participate in this exhibition to show that they are not Nazi, that they are not uh, deciding, making their decisions depending on passport or uh, citizenship. It's it's uh, that is now now it's 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 a, it's a trap. It's just a trap, and I'm really feeling very sorry for these artists now because now they are really in a very bad situation because they lost a lot of support from their motherland. <laughs> Let's call it like that now. So this is this is now is an issue. Thank you so much uh, for all your input. Does anybody has a question, follow up to this topic? Because I want to jump to something else. I think Gary has. Uh, it's not a, no, but you you can be first. Okay. Because I want to jump to some other uh, yeah, material. So, uh, we we always can come back. If you <laughs> <laughs> okay. we come back. back to it. I'm just. I have a lot of thoughts, and it was nice presentation and I'm sitting very close to the blueprint so I can see a little um, um, word in which is saying there is like curatorial statement, plates, translations um, and also there is thing which says modernity, national identity and the diaspora <laughs> and I'm like it's catching my attention like all the time like I'm watching it and I'm like <laughs> it, it um, what I want to talk about, it's about uh, artistic responsibility um, of, of curators, of people who are organizing Ukrainian exhibitions, who are supporting Ukrainian art, and uh, also seeing Ukrainian artists today as uh, someone who, in the world of internet and digitalization we know that nothing will be forgotten but they document are documentalist in the way of our reality they documenting war in all their actions what they are producing right now and maybe after victory they will be also the those prophets who can teach the world and our experiences um, to the global, to the global public, and um, yeah, I also want to just try to connect all this topic about um, what was said before about our modernity, about nas our national identity, and our role of diaspora, and uh, as a in its uh, artistic responsibility also. <laughs> uh, everything is artistic responsibility, <laughs> uh, and I wanted to point that we used to think that the situation that we have is somehow unique. But in historical perspective, it is not. And if we are talking about collaboration in negative uh, perspective of this word, we, uh, I had uh, a talk this morning with Hanna and she said that you have to research this situation what, when it was in Poland, for example, when some artists were collaborating with Germans the, in the times of Second World War, for example. So now we feel that it's unique, fresh situation, and now we are trying to build a policy in Facebook. <laughs> I just want to not to forget that it's in Facebook. It's imaginary field of discussion, but it's very narrow. In, it's a bubble. But we are trying, and now what can I, what, I'm always trying not to be in the moment, but try to see the historical perspective of this process. And, and I can see now that historical value of what is happening now, not, but because now it's shit storm. But in historical perspective, maybe, it will turn to developing of policy about, because of course Russian unfortunately not disappeared. 
they uh, really exist in cultural field. And uh, yes, I, I, I hope that you understand me correctly. They're still there, <laughs> here <laughs> in the in the city and uh, in Europe um, and in Ukraine. And but this situation will it's it's no it's not unique we in history we had such experience and we can and we can see how they made it how it was because everything it, it, how katya said that everything it, it was already <laughs> it was already and it's it's really something that uh, we need to learn and uh, of course, um, I think curatorial responsibility is uh, on the same line with artistic responsibility because curators are creating narratives and uh, it's, it's the same thing. And with Marta Kuzma, it was maybe first curatorial project, uh, such a big, uh, uh, such a big amount of uh, of historical of historical value of it, it's yes, of course. Of course we have responsibility of what we are talking every time. Sometimes uh, artists do not understand till the end what curators wanted to say. Yes, curators sometimes instrumentalize artists. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and it's the nature of this uh, cooperation. <laughs> it's it's a nature of that because uh, Artworks are communicating something, but when curators holding it together, it's about another like meta sense sense of uh, this artwork. So sometimes they are really great cardinals of meanings. <laughs> so yes, you are right. Got it. Yeah, because we are making recording. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, everything is recording, okay? Yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you that you put Slava. It's really important. Thank you for this. And uh, my question is about that. Uh, I think that metaphor of this is like war between uh, Krasne Soft Soul and uh, Ukrainian collage and something for me like this. <laughs> And uh, it's really important for me about uh, how to analyze and make a diagnostic about what is crassness of so and what is like Ukrainian art and Ukrainian collage because uh, for me it's a big question when I saw some works is it like art or is it just a reportage like journalistic reportage or is it just like is it art and property or is it just like a journalistic work? So, because uh, I think that uh, Russian propaganda really use this type of uh, discourse when you use this discourse like uh, like uh, make uh, some narrative which look like a journalistic work, and uh, I think that this is also a trap uh, which can be this part of this how you name it shit storm situation yeah this shit storm situation because you, we can we can be a part of this uh, trap because. Sometimes we can recognize something like art, but this is just like a journalistic work or you know, some reporter. So it's a question for you how you recognize this. Yeah, but uh, art is safe territory. That's why if you're optimistic, <laughs> you better choose to perceive something as art because it's more safe and more free for uh, some meanings or something. But if we're talking about art versus document, or art versus journalistic, nothing can be more powerful than document. For example, I work also with uh, Russian war crimes photographs. And when I curate exhibition, and for example now in Humboldt University's exhibition of Russian war crimes photographs and video by Alexei Sai, and uh, and now it's uh, it's there till Monday, I guess. So please uh, see it if you if you want. But and uh, when I when I work with that, I understand that nothing can be more powerful than photograph from Bucha, for example. Nothing can can win that. 
no art, no reflection, even very deep, in very, very much, in a very good quality. Cannot be that. And it's something that already history knew, knew about that. And of course, if we are talking about journalistic principles, it's a principle of facts, truth, and balance. What balance we can talk about now? What balance? We cannot create balance between us and Russians because there are no reality there. It's only fake in reality. They don't need real, real situation to show something. They just can create it. <laughs> it, it. It's absolutely not needed for them. They are very far from reality. So we cannot build, and that's why for us it's always very funny about this dialogue. What dialogue? It's like to create a dialogue with, I don't know, with, uh, with whom? It's better to create dialogue with a uh, chicken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, when I saw this uh, photograph from um, 2004 uh, on the Orange Revolution, um, uh, I was uh, in a school in this time, but uh, um, I, I, I hear about this, about this, no, it was funny, okay, okay. I know that there are a lot of people uh, that I know in Russia, in St. Petersburg, that also tried to do uh, such actions, and they do it permanently. There is some groups uh, what make literal reading clubs, philosophical clubs. They do it all the time. They uh, take a point uh, to do what they understand that this is very important. But uh, like this um, performance on the Russian Revolution, nobody understands them. Uh, people just uh, watching it, what, and uh, go uh, to their um, concrete message. Uh, but this message uh, was not also uh, really formed uh, good. And uh, the big question, how to build this message and how to um, create it with other people, while uh, the revolution must include everyone, and <laughs> I but think art, this is, but this art is not doesn't. Uh -huh. uh, they understand that all their work, what they are uh, doing for all these years, feministical uh, and other, other, other uh, it is it doesn't work. Um, you talk now about Russians. Yes, yes I, I talk about Russian because a lot of people of Ukrainian, uh, my uh, friends, they don't know them and uh, they think that they was not nothing like this. Uh, I was uh, looking on it a long time and uh, I uh, understand that the situation is very hard. They cannot uh, change the situation and uh, a lot of them stayed and uh, they want to watch what will be then, um, and I think that these people also need um, to be understandable, and uh, to understandable that these people are also like us. Uh, they try to do something, but a lot of our Ukrainian people don't also think about it when uh, they don't made reading clubs, they don't made. Uh, uh, any social works, just uh, when uh, the uh, enemy. Enemy, enemy came, they understand, I am a warrior and I will... Okay, I understand a, uh, your point. Um, first of all, um, we understand that, of course, uh, Russia had uh, some uh, part of this society, especially artistic societies, artistic community, that were trying to do some progressive things, that were trying to change situation. We all understand. We, we all understand that they really had one, that they really were there. And also we have to face that they fucked up. Now we have this unique historical moment that we can value, that we can see that they didn't succeed already. It's finished. They didn't succeed. They fucked up. Nothing more is possible. 
And the question is how they have, after that, they have also to face that, that they fucked up, they didn't succeed with all, with all their progressive ideas, all their underground movements for three people, literature club, uh, cinema club or something, they, they didn't succeed with that. Of, yes, okay, uh, art as a strategy for Russian failed. You know why? Because Russian government used culture. They put a lot of millions and billions of euros to use culture as instrument of imperialization. They, I can give you a million examples. For example, uh, Pompidou Center in Paris. They made um, a gift collection called, uh, how it called, mm, the collection with uh, on the red red collection with the explanation mark and they gave um, two million uh, euros for them as a gift to research this collection uh, should i mention that they included ukrainian artists in this collection and called it russian and they put a lot of money for that that's why there are no cultural front in russia because government used them they use them, every one of them, even those who think that they're underground, even those who made uh, reading clubs for three people. Them are also instrumentalized by Russian government. Because Russian government, and this is a critique for Ukrainian government, they used culture, they knew that culture is a tool, a very effective tool. Uh, please use culture as a tool. Please do it now. Come on. Uh, please give us a good minister of culture. Please. We are ready. No, no, it's not like that. Because we in Ukraine, for all these years of independence, we learned how to live without government, how to, uh, how to provide culture without government how to, to make it on the horizontal things, on uh, DIY strategies, we are super powerful on DIY strategies, and pandemic showed that. Because while all European uh, institutions were suffering and struggling and crying that there is no culture anymore, we are dying, we were learning, uh, learning another strategies and we were teaching European institutions how to work in such conditions, because we can work without government, but no one else does. Yes, it's our power, but come on, uh, we cannot go further without government. And, uh, and another thing about, uh, about Russians. Uh, yes, they failed with their cultural strategies, with all their reading clubs and everything, all this underground, all this partisan movement, they failed. But let them behave like failures. But no, no, like victims, you failed. Take this responsibility that you failed. You failed, you fucked up. Just cry about this, cry loudly about this. And then after that, maybe, maybe some people will feel like them. But they failed and now they are victims, come on. You but, failed. But who mm, should be the judge? I'm sorry, <laughs> who should be the judge of this uh, lament? Also, the, the governments and we don't, uh, we who don't, are in instrumentalizing. We don't need judge. It's obvious they failed. No, I'm, I'm saying that if you're saying that, just say it. Mm -hmm. Say it who? To For example, uh, if, we are, if we can imagine policy, how to work with Russians, just imagine. Imaginary, no, safe territory, imaginary. Um, how can, for example, I can imagine how I can work with Russian, with, okay, I'll try. This, uh, in Hag, first of all, and after Hag, for example, uh, this person from artistic or cultural field, um, first of all, this person should face that they are guilty, that they take responsibility for everything that happened. Not act like a victim, come on. You were paying taxes. You were paying taxes. For example, this Ina Zemtseva curator, she was paying taxes till 24th of February. Come on. 
they then they use this, this taxes to 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 kill us. <laughs> no, it's it's very simple. It's very simple. It's no dilemma there. It's very very simple. And the first they need to of course they yeah yeah a lot of Russians <laughs> of course they in this situation of course they they uh, first of all they have to face it and to take this responsibility to share this responsibility not to distance themselves from that come on it's a it's a mature position I, I also know some cultural figures who really don't try to um, to wash themselves with us, who just telling we that we are extremely sorry, and that's all. Not trying, th we are extremely sorry, but they are just extremely sorry, and that I think that's the only one natural position for that. Only one for now. Okay, let's uh, close the topic of good Russians. It's boring as fuck. Um, can I ask you to go back to yeah. the previous slide? Because it's also very connected to what you were saying. So about this exhibition. Yes, you were saying that uh, the specific groups um, in Russia, they fucked up because uh, the narratives, they were... Da -da 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 -da. So... Um, I'm sorry because I don't know a lot about this exhibition, but what I heard from the lecture that um, this exhibition um, was in Crimea and the huge public discussion in Crimea in 2012, I'm sorry, yes. So um, for understanding is most of the Crimean Ukrainians Ukrainian passport already had Russian passports. Yes, it's a huge invasion of this Russian population in Crimea. So it's a complicated region. We completely fucked up, of course, that region also. Agree. But uh, interesting. So you said about that these artists, they brought the only one contemporary exhibition and they brought these topics. Topics of gender. No, I understand that the uh, deep meaning is, of course, about masculinity. Masculinity is about mm -hmm. power, blah, blah. But is it the same fucked up, absolutely out topics that artists in contemporary art, they wanted to share that, look, civilization, we are all civilized, we're sharing the same topics. But is it really was critical and very important topic of, I'm sorry, gender in fucking Sevastopol in 2012? Is it the same situation with Russian artists who fucked up of all of this uh, feministic uh, and all of that, let's blah, 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 mm -hmm. the main uh, topic in Russia, what is important? Yes, so it's like uh, just that. Yeah, I understand what, uh, your question. It's really a very right question for, for this exhibition. Um, but... I would um, now would value this exhibition as, you know, as a very good beginning of something that didn't happen, because of course, um, it's it's a discussion about how about uh, between uh, audience are st is stupid or uh, we should uh, uh, we should grow our audience it's it's between those uh, very radical points uh, and um, for artists when they go somewhere they don't want to 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 put their agenda down you know it's like they have agenda that they're working with they are developing this agenda. And when they want to go somewhere to like discover another territories of your country, they they want to go there with their thinking, not trying to like, uh, f you know, that for me is a topic of uh, dem democracy of perceiving art is very important. And, uh, and I can criticize them uh, a lot of hours about that, but they, brought them the best they, they, they had. <laughs> uh, for example, there were one Russian group in this exhibition. 
So they, they, uh, no, uh, it was exhibition not only from Ukrainian artists. I'm sorry for this picture, but it's all, always about archive. It's, uh, there is no good picture of this <laughs> exhibition. Uh, but, uh, but they had group from all uh, uh, post-Soviet territories there. So they were not trying uh, to put there some, I don't know, nationalistic agenda. They put very, very wide. Yes, of course. Yes, yes. Of of course, for them it was it was terra incognita, absolutely for for them, absolutely. But they just went there, and I think it's it's um, now it's like his, it's uh, that's why it's absolutely fit to this topic. Because uh, to make exhibition in Crimea in 2012 called disputed territory. <laughs> Of course, they uh, made it more white about, uh, and of course, it, it was very good beginning. So, of course, it failed because there were no pro prolong prolongation of this, because uh, in two years it, it just was cut. It. But, but it, it was very good beginning of something that didn't prolong. Yeah, I think it's the last question, or maybe <laughs> one of the last ones. So my question will be really imaginary one. Uh, so uh, if you think of yourself, imagine as a curatorial prophet, uh, how, what do you think when Ukraine will have uh, its own? Uh, <laughs> Museum of Contemporary Art. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> and if it is uh, this Museum of Contemporary Art, for example, in, like, I don't know, in five years, let's imagine, uh, will you work there? Oh. <laughs> First of all, um, I hope that this government now have opportunity first uh, in all historical times of Ukrainian independence to feel that art and culture really works. It's uh, really I have this hope. When we were opening uh, exhibition in April 2022, we had special address from President Zelensky and he was talking about cultural front, that culture is uh, extremely relevant now. And I, uh, it really was a beginning of my hope that <laughs> someday situation in uh, uh, Ukrainian government will change. Uh, they, uh, uh, some miracle will happen and they will believe in culture as a, as a not not even as a tool, but as something valuable. Because um, if we uh, will look to a uh, history of our ministers changing in Ukraine, it's really I'm going to start to cry. Um, but now we have this special chance. Maybe Yulia Fedev will come, uh, uh, minister of culture, and this is uh, hope for us. And. Of course, our uh, cultural community is very, extremely toxic because there are 15 people <laughs> there <laughs> that hate each other totally. And that is because, because of hunger, because we don't have enough institutions and we, we have very bad cultural education. It's true. It is reality. And that's why all the uh, cultural workers are like heroes and it's always niche. It's always something you can work on 15 projects simultaneously uh, because you're crazy and hero and uh, not loved. I don't know. It's a lot of uh, reasons <laughs> to work in cult, not money. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's, um, um, of course, question if I would work in a uh, museum of contemporary art, it's a question of uh, whom I would work with. <laughs> because uh, I'm uh, in contemporary art of Ukraine since uh, 2009 and I have a lot of enemies. <laughs> a lot of people hate me. Uh, so uh, that is uh, reality. But of course, uh, of course, I will find a way to help this museum. Of course, it's 
because it's something that I hope uh, I will not die before this museum is, is established. Yes, because it's really, an, uh, it's an, now it's like anecdotic situation already, but come on, more than 30 years of independence and we still don't have this, uh, this thing. And we had a lot of uh, first thing that President Zelensky said, first thing, after inauguration, that was, he said, I will make you a museum of contemporary art. We were like, what? <laughs> so we are still waiting. Uh, we know that he now is busy with uh, some and other things. Uh, so we're uh, still waiting. <laughs> okay, uh, and last small uh, question about the place of this museum. Uh, do you like Ukrainsky Dim, uh, like Ukrainian house, as a place for the... <laughs> <laughs> it's very symbolic, of course, because it was uh, built as a museum of Lenin. But it's very, very, very hard to to make exposition of art there but uh, nobody cares <laughs> because please give us something <laughs> yes but it's really it's not easy place to uh, to make exposition it's a place where built to put a huge head of lenin inside and that's all functions of this place i i love it in terms of architecture it's really beautiful and it's the most beautiful when nothing is there <laughs> so <laughs> like nothing can make it better so uh, but i think for the moment it doesn't matter we just need even one room for the museum it will grow but we need uh, we need a sign from government that it's needed. Because we, we, of course, we build all Ukrainian history of art on private institutions and DIY strategies. But, okay, it's very romantic and very exotic, but come on, we are grown up, mature country. Can we please have a real museum? <laughs> I think we deserve that. <laughs>